thank you so much. I'm so excited to be doing my first presentation with the Theosophical Society because I've been studying theosophy since I was a little kid. So for me, I was raised as a direct descendant of the founding families of the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so with all of the intensity and the trauma that comes with being raised essentially in a hyper-religious environment or in a religious cult environment, there is often one of two ways that you relate to spirituality. You either really, really like it and you really go into it and explore it, or you are repelled by it. You hate it. You go in the opposite direction. And for me, I did both at different times. And this is really exciting for me because it was actually through the Theosophical Society that I found that there could be a different path outside of one religious tradition or one religious path being the exact perfect path. So my introduction to the Theosophical Society first happened around age 10. And through the exploration of the things that I learned in the writings of Helena Blavatsky and Annie Besant was, was that there are a set of perennial universal teachings that exist as a golden thread within each of the major world spiritual traditions. And what we're going to be talking about today is the miracle of daily mindfulness. Now, one of my books, my third book is called Daily Mindfulness, and it's set up like a 365-day practice guide. And what makes this practice guide a little bit different than traditional mindfulness practices is that in mindfulness, we, we hear the term mindfulness primarily coming out of the Hinayana or Theravada schools of Buddhism. And these schools of Buddhism are considered the earlier schools of Buddhism uh, that, that sprouted up directly from the Buddhist teachings and that um, sort of had a mutation over the years into the Mahayana and even another more esoteric mutation into the Vajrayana. And so when we hear about mindfulness, a lot of times we are really hearing about Buddhism, the original teachings of Buddhism, or the path of individual liberation. And what I'm talking about is that Buddhist concept of mindfulness, but also from more of a theosophical perspective, more of an interfaith perspective, where we aren't just staying within the Buddhist realm, but we're holding more of an open awareness into the ways that the different spiritual traditions uh, would relate to this similar kind of idea. So the miracle of daily mindfulness is really about achieving the esoteric state that each of the world spiritual traditions has us cultivate. And these special states of consciousness are cultivated through meditation, prayer, fasting, uh, scripture study. In the, uh, in the Catholic monastic traditions, there was a practice called Lectio Divina, or divine study, where uh, the Bible was studied, prayer and meditation practices would happen after the, the, the actual scripture study, and new expressions, new realizations of those Bible studies would come and sprout forward. They would materialize through the study and meditation on them. And now, this is really, really different than what we normally hear about when we think about and explore traditional spiritual or religious practices. And that's where the miracle comes in. We're saying the miracle of daily mindfulness because the daily achievement of the esoteric state, which we'll talk more about, provides the shift in perspective which is the miracle that takes us out of a state where we feel as if the world around us is controlling how we feel that we're at the effect of our environment, allowing us to engage in that new state of consciousness that to experience that miracle, that transformation where we actually are more sovereign and we have more control over what we're experiencing. It doesn't always mean that we're going to have more control over what's happening in the outside world, but we will have more control over our own relationship to it. So thank you so much for being here. I, I can't wait to, to dive into this. 
And the, the first thing that I want to do is take us all together into a meditation. So let's take a moment and close our eyes and allow ourselves to sit in a restful position for just a moment. And I want you to bring your awareness into the breath. And with each breath, allow the exhale to bring a wave of relaxation through every part of the body. You can notice the different thoughts or images or phrases or words or ideas coming up in your mind. but remain present with the breath. Becoming aware of the different sounds and movement happening in the space around you. As well as all the subtle movements within your own body. allowing every exhale to send a wave of relaxation throughout the body. And with a deep breath, let's gently open our eyes. So what we did just now was a version of a Zazen breath awareness practice paired with active relaxation. And this is because more often than not in our lives, our nervous system is in response to what it is that we're experiencing. So you wake up in the morning and your, your first reaction may be to your alarm. And your second reaction may be to your partner. And you start to see how little by little, everything that the outside world is communicating causes our nervous system to have a subtle reaction. And each of those little reactions that our body has starts to amount to tension in the body. And more often than not, what we do is we allow that tension to accumulate over days, weeks, months, and years. And those of us who are in our 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond, we've had that chronic tension from decades of lived experience, real life experience, anchoring itself into the body. And so mindfulness isn't all about intellectualizing or operating within the mind. It's about allowing the mental capacity to saturate the fullness of the moment, mindfulness. We allow our awareness to be fully saturated in the total reality of the actual experience of the present moment as it really is right now. Mindfulness can help us navigate our stressors and our challenges in our lives because we can become more aware of what they really, really are. When you are, when you're, when you're driving in the car and your windshield is totally clear and you're driving down a clear road, you can see other cars coming down the other way from a mile away. When you are driving in really extreme weather circumstances and your windshield wipers are going and they're going as fast as they can, but they still can't keep up with the rain and you're down a windy road, maybe on a, a really wooded street with a lot of obstructions, you can't always see what's coming your way. And it's in those opportunities where we have to slow down and we have to be extra careful about what it is that we're navigating so that we can operate our car safely. And practicing mindfulness is like being able to become aware, like, wow, there's a lot of different circumstances that are causing obstruction to my awareness right now. And so I can cultivate new awareness. I can cultivate that practice. In the, in the metaphor of driving, in that example, we slow down. If there are a lot of obstructions in the road, if your windshield wipers maybe aren't working or there's extreme weather, you slow down. So you can see where you're going and you can see what's coming towards you. Being 
in the practice of mindfulness or being in the esoteric state, which is when you're in a present moment of total awareness, when you're in the esoteric state or you're in a state of mindfulness, it's akin to driving very cautiously down a treacherous path. A treacherous path can actually be navigated oftentimes very safely if you're very aware of the way you're navigating it. And now where, where and when does this come up in our actual lives? Well, think about your most important relationships. Think about the people that you interact with the most. Oftentimes we have subtle disagreements. Sometimes we have overt disagreements. Sometimes that we're sometimes we're navigating challenging situations with coworkers, colleagues, family members, even roommates or extended family. A lot of times we don't get to choose the people or the circumstances that we find ourselves within and around. And so these practices are ways where we can actually reclaim the little amount of control that we do have in the world. Just as we say that we, we only understand 1% of what's happening because we can only understand from our own perspective, we can only really experience 1% of what everything is taking place in the moment. And so in each moment where we're cultivating mindfulness, we actually increase that 1%. We increase not only that 1% of the awareness we have of the moment, we also increase our awareness of our lack of awareness. So when we are cultivating awareness, when we're cultivating mindfulness, we find that we start to realize, wow, there are certain things I don't know. There are certain things about this other person's life that I'm not aware of. There are certain things that that person's going through that I don't know about. And it helps us adjust. It helps us attune ourselves to the experience that we're having so that we can actually be more and more us. What are the different ways? So those are the benefits of mindfulness. Those are the ways that mindfulness shows up in our lives. What are the ways that we can actually cultivate it? Well, the reason it's so important that we realize that mindfulness isn't just about meditation. It's not just about understanding sutras or scriptures or platitudes or uh, one-liners that are, that are helpful. It's really about the esoteric state. So when we meditate, when we enter into a meditative state of consciousness, what happens is we adjust out of the default operating system and into a conscious operating system. And that's what the miracle is. The miracle alone is the shift from, from one automatic perspective into a conscious perspective. And so you'll find that every major world spiritual tradition has that path. There is this notion that we have a lower nature and a higher nature. And this is expressed in different spiritual traditions in different ways. And the important part is for us to learn that it's true, not to learn which way it's true for us, but to learn that it's true, that it is true, that I, I have to own the fact that I have desires, wants, cravings that are from the lower part of my nature. And then I also have callings, inspiration, guidance from the higher part of my nature. The lower nature, our lower nature, humanity's dual nature has a higher and lower. The lower nature is associated with the body and it's associated with automatic reactivity. And the higher nature is associated with the spirit or with the soul or with the unseen realm, the inner world. The lower nature is the outer world. The higher nature is the inner world. And so our, our merging of the two can only happen in the present moment. So often we hear things like, oh, when you're thinking about the past, that's where depression comes from. When you're, when you're thinking too much about the future, that's where anxiety comes from. And this is true. But why is it true? It's because all of our power and all of our ability to engage with the universe 
comes from the present moment, comes from here, now, where we are right now, when we are right now. We can't choose how we're going to behave in the future. All we can do is prepare ourselves in this moment. And that's one of the most exciting things that you can actually get from a mindfulness practice of some kind. We we have the ability to cultivate an active relationship with our higher nature so that our lower nature can begin to become tame. It can begin to become more receptive to the impulses and the guidance of the higher nature. Here's one way of looking at it. The universe has, the universe is operating on a vibrational scale. And so everything is happening as if each star, each planetary body is vibrating at a highly unique frequency. And so begin to imagine that every single thing that exists emits some level of some kind of vibration, like a ripple out into the universe in all directions around you. Our lower nature is drawing upon that and having an immediate, almost like a chain reaction or a chemical reaction to what we're experiencing. Have you ever walked into a room and felt like the energy in the room was cold and dead? Have you ever experienced having a totally comfortable time and someone else walking into that room and freezing the energy, icing out the energy? Someone walks in and everyone just goes cold. Contrastly, have you ever been in an environment that was so vibrant and warm and felt so inviting and welcoming that you transitioned out of a withdrawn state and into a social state? Have you ever been that person? Maybe you feel great and you enter into an environment that's stale, that's cold, that's quiet, that's unvibrant, and you bring in new energy. Maybe some of you are the life of the party everywhere you go. You bring that vibrant energy. That is that is the perfect metaphor for looking at the way that we experience the world vibrationally. And so when we're thinking about mindfulness and we're thinking about cultivating mindfulness, it's about tuning our energy up, not too high so that we're bulldozing everyone around us, but not so low that we're we're at the effect of every twist and turn and everything that's going on. Have you ever heard the term empath? Maybe you identify as an empath. Maybe sometimes you feel Like you can tell exactly what someone else is feeling without them even articulating it. I know for me as a highly sensitive person myself, I grew up in a family where I could tell exactly what my mom was upset about. I could tell exactly what my mom was experiencing when my dad seemed to have no idea what he did that just upset her. And so I remember from a young age being able to say, dad, she's upset because of this. She's mad at you because you did this. And it was that sensitivity, that empathic quality where I could feel what other people are feeling. Maybe you have that too. That caused me to sometimes be depressed when other people were depressed. Caused me to sometimes have my anxiety increase when I see crazy things on TV or on the news. It's like my limbic system, my nervous system reacted to everything that's happening on TV or on the news as if it's happening right here in the same room as me. And this can be extremely challenging. This can make it really challenging to keep a job. It can make it really hard to maintain relationships with our friends, with our family members, and it can make it impossible to achieve some of the goals that we have in our lives. And sometimes the goals that we have in our lives aren't even that ambitious. Sometimes we have a desire in our heart where we want to learn more. We want to understand more. We're seeking the mystery. We're seeking to understand about divinity or about spirituality or about the the more esoteric secrets of the universe. And those can all be available to us if we know how to access them, but they can also be dampened and blocked from us if we're unable to manage our own relationship to our own mind 
and our own emotions. And so when we enter into the realm of mindfulness, we find that there are exercises similar to the meditation we just did, exercises that help us bring our focus more specifically into the things that we're physically experiencing. So like in our meditation practice, we brought our awareness to the subtle sounds and movement happening all around us. And what that does is that helps us orient ourselves into a space where we can become aware of all of the little things happening around us. Imagine uh, a scene in, in a movie where, where the main character closes their eyes and they can still fight the invisible enemy, or they can still sense the subtle nuances of what's happening around them. And that's actually a real skill that you can actually develop. What we want to do is not mutate and become some kind of superhuman with special abilities, even though maybe that's part of what we're drawn to. Maybe that's part of what we're inspired by. You know, we love watching the secular stories of Marvel comics or uh, or the DC stories of Superman and Wonder Woman and Iron Man and, and all of these beautiful uh, archetypal powerful beings. We've been, we've been following superhuman stories for thousands of years in all the different world traditions. If you look at the oldest re religious texts in the world, the Vedas, you find that there are a lot of superheroes. There are a lot of gods and goddesses and avatars and, and um, mahavatars and Buddhas and bodhisattvas and dakas and dakinis and all these different kinds of beings who have supernatural abilities or in the yoga sutras, what we call siddhis. CD powers. And these abilities, when you read, for example, in the third book of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, you read the, the special abilities that are achieved through meditation. And at their highest point, they're very supernatural. <laughs> and they're very magical, and they're very exciting and very inspiring. And, and so we can tell that for thousands of years, humanity has been inspired by these ideas that we could do extraordinary things like, like fly or like travel uh, but through teleportation or being in more than one location at once or have total clairvoyance, completely understanding exactly what's happening in a situation, seeing the future, remembering past lives, recalling past lives of other people materializing things out of thin air. All of that has always been in our view as a people, as a species. We've always been inspired by the miraculous and the exciting. But what we want to do today is look more closely at the step from here. Not the end goal of having superpowers, that many of the ancient traditions often used as a way to guide us forward in our practice, to inspire us. But that first step, that first step right now, which is similar to what is found at the beginning of the third book of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, before it gets into the big superpowers, where there are simple powers. And some of those simple powers are the ones that we're here to cultivate, we're here to learn about, and you can actually experience them today. And that first superpower is living in compressed time. Time is one of the most complex, confusing, interesting things because we go through this life experience and it, it seems like our lives are, are one linear timeline. We, we use timelines and we look at them and we look at certain events as a bullet point on the timeline. And we also see the way the, the planet rotates and we measure time based on the rotation of the planet. But in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, one of the first benefits that we get from practicing mindfulness, from practicing meditation, is living in compressed time. And what does that mean? That means that we are able to be so present, so free from distractions and distracting forces, and so aware of the past, and so clear of how our experiences echo out karmically into the future, 
that this moment becomes a highly concentrated moment. We've all heard the expression, I lost track of time. Time flies when we're having fun, right? And so the, what I want to suggest is that time can slow down when you're having fun. Time can slow down when you're mindful. In fact, it does. If you've ever had to do anything monotonous for a long period of time, you know that one of two things can happen. Every second can drag on and on and on. Or time can just fly by. If you're beating, if you're beating a mala and you're taking beads and you're stringing them, you can do it in, a, in such a way where each bead you're so present with that you actually are in such a compressed time that each minute feels like five minutes, or you can actually be in such a flow with that process where you lose track of it entirely and that hour can fly by. And so the first CD power, the one that we're talking about today is time control. And that's where the daily part comes in, the miracle of daily mindfulness. This is the magic of making your one life super meaningful. Now, whether you believe in past lives or, or re in reincarnation or not, basically doesn't matter. What we can agree on, what most world spiritual traditions can agree on, is that birth is not the beginning of the life experience, and that death is not the end of the life experience. So whether you believe that that birth, you came from heaven and God created you, and you're sort of in this Judeo-Christian Islamic uh, worldview of coming from a heaven realm, incarnating for your one lifetime, and then disincarnating and exiting off into another realm, or you believe in the reincarnation worldview where you have lived many lifetimes and birth is just the transition from a previous lifetime into this lifetime. Death is just the transition from this lifetime into the next lifetime. What we find, the common understanding is again, that birth is not the beginning and death is not the end. But this lifetime is the important part. What happened before you were born is not as important as what happens now. What happens later after you die is not as important as what happens now. And so the miracle of daily mindfulness is about breadcrumbing yourself out, giving yourself some kind of gift, a gem, to follow every single day so that you can have a glimpse into the higher world so that you can attune yourself to the higher vibration so that you can train your lower nature to become more receptive to the impulses of the higher nature. Now we often make mistakes that we already knew were going to be mistakes, right? There are some mistakes that we made and we were really trying to do the right thing. There are some mistakes that we've made where we are going out of our way to try to do the right thing and it still doesn't work out. And those aren't the moments I'm talking about. The moments I'm talking about right now are the moments where you knew better. So take a moment and consider when was a moment in your life when you did something that you knew wasn't going to be good for you. And we can keep it easy. We don't need to we don't need to go into any kind of like crazy shame cycles. But what I want to do is illustrate that sometimes we do know better. Sometimes we eat that extra slice of pizza that we don't really need. Sometimes we have the the last few bites of that piece of cake that we don't need that we know isn't good. Sometimes if you're like me, you'll you'll sneak in a little extra dessert here and there. You're, you'll sneak in a little treat somewhere. 
Now, I'm not saying that you should feel bad about that or that there's any kind of like huge karmic consequences of that, but there are the normal amounts of karmic consequences. When we eat something that spikes our blood sugar, for example, we have a glucose spike in the body. And then the body has to then experience the glucose spike, process the glucose, and we often have a glucose crash. And that is its own karma. And so think about all of the different times where we've made, where we make little mistakes here and there, where we're doing something that we know isn't going to work out in our highest good, where we send an email saying things that we don't mean. We send a text message. We, we say those harsh words to somebody that we love. We do something impetuous, maybe, maybe while we're driving or, or in, or at, in the workplace. Think about those little times when you pretty much knew better. It happens to all of us. And it's because in those moments, we're not fully present to what our higher nature would have us do. Our higher nature already knows that you've had enough Oreos for one lifetime. Our higher nature already knows that you've had enough drama for one lifetime. Your higher nature doesn't want you to get into more drama with your coworker. There's, there's necessary drama in life. And that's when something really serious is going on. Maybe someone passes away, someone dies, someone's got a serious illness or injury, or there's a serious circumstance that needs to be addressed. Those are examples of necessary drama that, that happens that we have no control over. And then there's this whole other category, and it's unnecessary drama. And if you're anything like me, you've created unnecessary drama in your life. And practicing mindfulness can help you reduce the amount of unnecessary drama in your life. There's an amazing expression that says, every day is a new life to a wise person. Every day is a new life to a wise person. And so think about that. Think about sleep at night serving as the little death. And arising the next day in the morning as the new birth. Imagine if that each day is a new life and you have the added advantage of being able to remember yesterday, your past life. Imagine what a wise person would do with that new life. Think about your wisdom. Think about the fact that you have been through painful, challenging, extraordinary circumstances. And you have. Even if you haven't processed through extraordinary, insane circumstances and drama and trauma and all the big scary things, we're not comparing anyone to anyone else. What I want you to do is acknowledge that life is extraordinarily challenging. To be human is extraordinarily challenging. And how you experience it matters. And so the gift and the invitation is the recognition that you have access to the esoteric state at any time. And that esoteric state will help you navigate every one of those challenges just a little bit better. It'll help you avoid any unnecessary drama and it'll help you provide you with the fortitude and the wisdom and the presence to navigate all of that necessary drama that's gonna happen no matter what we do no matter how well we prepare, no matter all of the different safeguards we put into place to protect ourselves. Sometimes life is just challenging. And so because we can't be prepared for everything, we have to prepare ourselves for anything. And if we are willing to recognize how important how you see the world is, how important your life experiences, how you feel 
about the world, how you feel about your circumstances, how you relate to them. If we can go there, then anything can change. If we can change the way we look at things, the things we look at will change. So I'm Ben Decker. I'm so grateful to be doing this. I'm going to take you through one more exercise. And this is just to send a little blessing to future you, to the you tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that. So let's take a moment and close our eyes and enter into that esoteric state. And we do that by taking a few deep breaths. And we relax the body. Imagine that every exhale can send a wave of relaxation through every part of the body, decompressing the muscles in the body, opening up any areas of tension and allowing energy to flow naturally where it's needed most. And as we allow the body to relax, while the mind is perfectly awake and alert, we subtly disengage from the patterns of automatic behavior. Noticing all of the subtle sounds and movement happening all around you. Just like you can notice the different images or thoughts occurring in your mind. Allowing everything to be exactly as it is just for now. And just saying to yourself, I am here now. Bringing all of your energy into this moment, this most important moment of this present moment now. I am here now. Sighing out the exhale, relaxation passing through the body. I am here now. And start to notice, feel that subtle shift in the vibration in your energy. That is the glimpse of the esoteric state. And now feel that, saturate yourself in that esoteric state, even if it's just subtle for you now. And say, I will remember this tomorrow. And I will remember this every tomorrow. I will remember this tomorrow. I will remember this every tomorrow. Take a deep breath, stretch, opening your eyes, stretch and adjust your body, get into the body. I like to crack my knuckles. People have mixed feelings about that. (laughs) But click back into your body, taking a few deep breaths and allow yourself to take a little shimmer 
of that esoteric state, that awareness, that awareness of the present moment with you everywhere you go and see if you can save yourself from a little bit of that unnecessary drama. See if you can show up and be a little bit more you every day. Thank you.